On this episode of Between Two Bears, we talk to Ross McKenzie. Macca was a first-team All-American in the US college system, a New Zealand National League winner with Waitakere United, a two-time Northern Premier League winner with Bay Olympic, a pro in Singapore, played for four NZFC teams, and has recently returned to New Zealand after a successful seven-year stint selling real estate in Dubai. Macca is one of New Zealand football's great characters, passionate, outspoken, laid back, and always up for a laugh. He's also my brother-in-law, which allowed us to navigate some pretty personal confronting areas at ease. We talked about his superstar final year at Akron University in the States and the decisions that led to him bombing the MLS Combine, his infamous tantrum in the 2010 Chatham Cup final when he was dragged after 34 minutes, the death of his mother Mary, the highs and lows of his transient football career, why Kevin Fallon called him Houdini and why Shane Knowles rates him as one of the best two players he's ever coached. This episode was sponsored by former Waikato youth goalkeeping prodigy Dale Warburton. Dale now resides in Wellington, is a top bloke and is one of New Zealand football's best follows on Twitter. Thanks for your support Dale. Listen to this episode on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts and lastly, this episode has some bad language, probably not a good one to listen to with the kids. Hope you enjoy. Ross McKenzie, welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks, Steve. Good to be here. We're back live in the Hamilton studio. Level two means we can uh, have friends over for beers and podcasts. Touch bubbles. Yeah, so it's nice to be back. We, we, we did about four or five podcasts over the video internet calls, um, which worked well, but not quite the same as the natural feel of sharing mm. a studio together, Shay. Intimacy. I can look into Ross's eyes. I feel the love. Engage how he's going to react. It's nice. So let's get started. How do you know Ross McKenzie? Let's go back to 2002 in Hamilton. I was playing for Claudelands Rovers and we had a midweek game against Melville United at Gower Park. On the number two. On the number two. I don't remember the score. I do remember ending up in the Outback Inn later that night which we spoke about with Anton Devsic on episode 22. 21. And 21 episode? <laughs> yeah, we have. Oh, <laughs> and um, there was some guy that I didn't really recognise, and he was in the in the outback, and everyone was kind of gathering around him and laughing, and he had a cheese cutter on. And I thought, who yeah. the fuck is this guy with a cheese cutter on? And it was Ross McKenzie. <laughs> and that was the first time I'd ever met Ross McKenzie, and then he disappeared off the face of the earth after that. And then... We crossed paths again. I don't really know when and where, but you married a sister. <laughs> Maybe the main wedding? No, I I, um, I missed that one. Mm. <laughs> well, you've kind of given away the, the punchline of my intro, but we'll go anyway. I, I met Ross um, during the New Zealand Secondary Schools Tour of Europe, um, I think 2001. Uh, yeah, hell of a team. Uh, Nathan Strom, Matt Kinnean, Peter Halstead, Stephen Old, Wayne Rooker, uh, Ross McKenzie was the striker. So we were teammates. Um, and then he came to Melville, I think, the year after that, and we spent the season together, formed a bit of a bond. And then we were both in America together. He was at Akron, I was at Monmouth. Um, so we kept in touch. Um, I used to hang out at his place in Fongamata over New Year's, um, developed nice. a, a strong friendship. And somewhere along the way, his little sister became quite appealing. Uh, Why are you and, looking at me and not looking at Ross? Wow. And so I married her. Um, yeah. So now Bloody we... good job you did. So, so now we um, yeah, see a lot of each other. And family. Now you're family. Family. We're family. Um, so I know Ross very well. And I'm excited today about getting into some details of um, his career on and off the field and what the hell he's been doing for the last seven years. So the place we're going to start today, Ross, is we're going to take you back to 2010. Uh, Chatham Cup final. Uh, <laughs> Bay Olympic against Miramar. And it was a day me and Seamus were actually in attendance. Uh, we were friends with a lot of the, you guys in the Bay Olympic team. Um, Michael Main and Colin Gardine and Joey Edwards and Yoji and Tristan McCormick and Nathan Strom. So Tris Clark. 
we we had a big day planned and it started with a champagne breakfast i think at the bay olympic club rooms olympic park portage road yeah at about 10 a.m um and we were on our way we were steaming i think we i think bay olympic were favorites weren't they going to that far oh it was a good miramar team but we'd had a skinful by the time we got to the ground do you remember the bus ride I do remember the bus ride. We were in a, we were there was maybe at least there was definitely at least two buses. The bus that was in front of us, there was a few club stalwart spectators and um, a lady <laughs> got quite <laughs> excitable on the bus ride to Albany from Portage Road and exposed herself yeah. to the bus behind. She, she was known known for that sort of behaviour. It was yeah. it was kind of her, it was, party, it was, her party trick. <laughs> <It> was a, <laughs> Big yeah, it was a raucous start at 1 p.m. on a Sunday, yeah. on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon, but that maybe set the tone. Yeah, uh. so, so we got to um, North Harbour Stadium, and there was a good collection of us all on our Bay Olympic colours. Excited for us, we were, his family were there, Bon and, and Al were, were there. Um, was Murray there? I don't know if Murray was there. I don't was think there. Muzzle was there. But, um, maybe it's for the best. Yeah, it didn't get off to a great start. Miramar went up 2-0 early doors, um, and Ross McKenzie's number actually got put up by the... Uh, fourth official um, at 34 minutes into the first half and <laughs> so this is where the story really starts Ross was not happy about being subbed um, Nolsey had decided that he'd done his dash for the day uh, Ross slumps his shoulders and sort of storms off the field takes his shirt off throws it in Nolsey's face says something like fuck you I'm never playing for you again and starts walking towards the, the changing rooms unfortunately for Ross it was on the other side of Albany Stadium. So he had to go right around the outside of the field, down the byline, and walk past us all on the way to the changing rooms. And so you can imagine we are all... We're a bit disappointed for him, but more we're, well, we're loving you it. You were never, ever disappointed for him. <laughs> this is like the best thing that could have happened to our friends. Bant- the banter oh, really oh. kind of kicked in as that slow trudge is coming. And it took an eternity. I feel like it took almost as long as he'd been on the field for him to come yeah. down towards the main grandstand. I think we got the old, oh, going. But he didn't relent. He wouldn't look up. And then it was just calls. It was, Macca! 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 And, he went, and eventually he gave a little, a little lift of the eye just to see what was going on. And about what fifteen of us all giving him the the, the wanker, wanker sign, sign. <laughs> and he was he was not happy. Um, so that was the talking point for us. The game was over, you know, basically by then they weren't coming back. Uh, I think Ross got straight on the beers. I think Al Mack, uh, Ross's dad, that hit Nolsey up um, in the club rooms after the game, uh, and yeah, it was a it was a bit tense. It was a bit tense afterwards. Um, so. Shay, you've actually reached out to Nolsey to get his perspective on that day. And just before we bring Ross in, um, I want you to read out what he said about it. So I think what was unknown, definitely unknown... Oh, I've, I've never heard Nolsey's opinion of this <laughs> ever, I don't think. So let's hear it. Yeah, so what, what I definitely wasn't aware of is that there might have been an injury cloud coming into the Chatham Cup final. So I reached out to, to Shane Knowles, who was coach of Bay Olympic team that day, and this is what he said. Honestly, mate, we did everything we could to get him to play. I felt I let him down due to giving him a fitness test the day before, which I think, if we're all honest, flared the injury up and caused stress come game day. On the day, I just felt he was struggling. We were also 2-0 down at that stage, and I just made a call. What was hard for Mecca was the fact he was young and didn't quite understand why I made that call. Mate, I have a huge amount of time for him, he is without any question in the top two best players I've ever coached and someone I helped out when things were tough for him. He's a terrific bloke. It's a big call. Nolsey's coached a lot of players. A lot of players. I'd like, I'd like to know number one is obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ross, time to bring you in. Talk us through that whole experience. Well, I'll, I'll give background on it. <clears throat> we were in the final and two weeks before it, we were playing against Forest Hill. And some guy came through and clattered me and fucked my knee, basically. Um, I think I did my... I later found out that it was my MCL. MCL? Yeah. That I did. Um, but I obviously didn't want to let on to <laughs> Nolsey or Baz Williams at the time that I'd done it. So I just said I was fine. 
Um, and I've known Baz for years, and Baz was actually the one that took me on the the fitness test, and and I knew when I was running at that fitness <laughs> test that I was nowhere near playing. Um, and I think Baz knew as well. But I said to Baz I was fine, and Baz said to Nolsey I was fine, and I ended up playing with a huge amount of strapping on my knee. I couldn't really run too well, <laughs> and I mean, 34 minutes, I honestly, I shouldn't have played one minute, um, and I probably should have let Wada, because he was the guy that missed out, um, I probably should have let him start or come in on the bench or whatever, but I didn't. Um, yeah, when I got dragged, I threw my shirt at Nolsey, told him to fuck off, and that I'd never play for him again, which obviously turned out not to be true. <laughs> played for him again the next season. Um, but yeah, I remember walking down the tunnel, raging. I remember Jesse Corey Slow. Mm, good man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good he man. was a fan, and he was just telling me how much of a cunt I was when I was walking <laughs> down the down the tunnel. Um, got in the changing rooms. I don't even remember seeing you guys or anything like that. Um, I got in, what, walking past us. Do you remember any of that? No, nah, I just remember Jesse Corey Slow's face. It was painted um, blue and white or whatever color they are. And then I remember being in the change room, getting changed. Everyone came in at half time. Noel was giving a speech. And as I walked out, I was just like, fuck you. Again, just to top it off. Went in the stand and got pissed with you boys. So help me understand something. Because you're saying now that you knew at the time you shouldn't have been playing and that you were undercooked. But then you still had this reaction that, what, who the fuck are you to substitute me? So how do those two things marry up? Oh, probably. <laughs> Probably the fact that it was the Chatham Cup final and I really wanted to play in it and wanted to win it and I thought that it was best for me to play, selfish, but I thought it was best for me to play over anyone else like you do when you're playing and stuff and yeah, I was just probably a bit embarrassed as well that I was getting dragged off in front of all my mates and family <laughs> and I don't know if it was on TV but if it was, it was a fucking disgrace. Have you ever watched the game back? <laughs> Why would I watch that? <laughs> Highlights of just me getting rinsed by my mates. Mm. Yeah, yeah. so it wasn't a good day. I remember I even had to sit in the bus. I went straight to the bus because we had to leave as a team or something. And I sat in the bus and I think I had to wait for about 45 minutes and I refused to talk to anyone until Joe Edwards got a drug test. <laughs> and of all people, we know that Joe would be a definite <laughs> pass. So. Yeah. So, so when looking back now, do you do you have are you filled with regret about what happened there, or do you oh, feel no. like you let the team down or anything like that? I probably did let the team down, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, nah, like I'm not I'm not worried about it. It proves a pretty good point for people. Always give me shit about it, so like it's a good chat to have with people. And I mean, whenever I'm on Facebook, people will message me about it. Not loads of people, obviously. Basically, you guys and a couple of other friends. Yeah. But, yeah. How much did, so again, two years earlier, yeah. you'd played for Dunedin Tech yeah. in the final and unfortunately lost again. Yeah. Now, you're not alone in that club of our mates who have lost two Chatham Cup finals. Jeremy Field has also done it. He did it back-to-back, so he's won better than you Back-to-back probably. Back-to-back is impressive. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how much of that, having played in one, lost one, then wanting to play in one and win one, did that factor into that kind of week? Well, it probably did. Um but in saying that, the same type of thing happened to me at Dunedin Tech in terms of two weeks before I was playing against uh, Mosgiel, I think, for Dunedin Tech and one of the lads got up and elbowed me, smashed my teeth out. So I was playing with a mouth guard like Stromy <laughs> in the final with fake teeth um, against George Surrey. Yeah. So I was obviously shit then, shit in the second final. Um but yeah, I guess it probably did want me. I did want to win it, but what can you do? Well, I think that's a good start. Um, <laughs> get some uh, demons out of the way early doors. So, so who is Ross McKenzie? For between two beers listeners, um, he's someone who was he was a regular on the football scene for a number of years, but he's, he's been off the grid for a little bit of late um so we've asked as we like to do we've asked around and and one of your former teammates um who's actually been on the show before joe edwards has has written in a little a few words about exactly who you were as a who you are sorry yeah thank you still with us as a, a player and a man so here's what joey says i first met ross when he arrived at a pre-season game at gower park for bay olympic As he arrived with only a pair of boots and no shin pads, he was the poor man's Robin to Nathan Strom's Batman. However, 
It only took him two minutes to emerge from Strom's dominating shadow, which is not easy, and to prove he wasn't merely a sidekick. As was the case at most clubs he played at, he rapidly became the most well-liked man in the dressing room. This is not surprising, because if you ask anyone in the football community who genuinely knows Ross, they will tell you he is someone who is one of the game's great characters and one of life's great characters too, is the first person you want in the changing room because of his banter, his self-deprecating humour and his loyalty to his teammates, is instantly likeable, it is a credit to him that he treats everyone the same and he'd be the first person to defend the youngest member of the squad if he perceived an injustice from a coach or senior player, that is a rare and highly valuable quality in any walk of life, will help anyone in any way he can defend what he believes is right. While people's initial reaction will be to describe Ross off the field, the reason they focus on off-field matters is because he is such a large personality. That should not detract from someone who, by his own admission, was neither quick nor overly athletic. Yet he had an outstanding football brain, a cultured left foot, a strong right foot for standing on, and he proved himself to be a top player in the New Zealand scene. There aren't many players who can comfortably play National League and Northern Premier League at left back, in the middle of midfield, behind the striker, or as a striker all while carrying a little pot belly and having the pace of a sloth on defective crutches, at least by the end of his career. He also proved to be the heartbeat in a number of strong Bay Olympic teams. When Ross played well, he made others look good and he made the team excel. So many of his attributes as a person came through on the football field, including his loyalty to his teammates, his calmness on set pieces, his occasional flare up resulting in the odd red card, as is the case with any misunderstood maverick and his biting wit. I like to think that it was that wit that led to a very well respected senior player telling him he was the most hated man in New Zealand football during a Northern Premier League game. In 2010. I suspect such a claim was made out of sheer frustration as Ross got the better of him on the pitch and then destroyed him with his quickfire banter. Or it could be that the senior player was more perceptive than me. Anyone who knows Ross will be looking forward to this pod, which is evidence of how well regarded he is by those that have had the pleasure to cross paths with him or at least play on the same team as there are clearly some Ross haters out there. So that's from Joe Edwards, who um, has obviously put a lot of time and thought into that, and he's, he's delivered. Yeah, um, ghost researcher for the podcast. Yeah, Get out involved in the Herald. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's your reaction to that? Do you, do you think he's, he's summed you up well, uh, Ross? Well, it's quite flattering, I guess, some of the stuff he said. Um, I, was, yeah, I, was, I was about to butt in and say, I think that most of the people at Auckland City probably didn't like me when I was there. Um when he said that people actually do, everyone likes me. I think the Auckland City guys didn't really like me, but that might have been because I was tarnished with the Wilkinson brush um, and involved with him. Um, but yeah, I don't know, I'm kind of a bit taken back by... It's a lot to take in. It was it's a very um, it's a very well-written and eloquent piece. I'd expect nothing less from Joe mm. Edwards, but pretty accurate. I'm also trying to think of who was the guy who told me that I was most hated, and I think I know who it is. Neil Sykes. I think it was Sykes, yeah. Neil Sykes, yeah. Um, He's always thought I was a twat, but... <laughs> not, sure, <laughs> not sure if you're a friend of the show, Neil Sykes, but um, if you're listening, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, shout out. Okay. <laughs> shout, out <laughs> shout out Neil Sykes. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's get into the backstory of, of how you became who you are. So I think we want to start at Mount Albert Grammar. Uh, Kevin Fallon, you, you went there in, in sixth form and spent two years under Kev. Yeah. Um, we had Chris James on the pod uh, a few weeks ago and he sort of spoke about he, he was only with Fallon for six months but the impact he had on him as a footballer was was huge um, Thanks. what are your strongest memories of that time at Mount Albert Grammar yeah look I thought Kevin was great when I was there I thought he was I thought he was awesome but it was probably something that I needed because I think that when I went there I came from Inglewood which was a small club or small high school in Taranaki, and there wasn't really any tough or like there wasn't any big tackles that went in. There wasn't really any um, there wasn't any big grafters in the game or anything like that. Whereas when you went to Mags, Kevin taught me a lot of I don't know. I think the first game that I played with Mags, I went and closed the keeper down, and as the keeper went to kick it, I jumped up and turned around, and he hauled me off. And he was like, hey, Max, you don't do that. And he he kind of taught me how to make sure that I went in 50-50s and go hard into tackles and um, have the right attitude towards the game. And I guess that they, when he was there, they kind of make you behave like a pro. And I thought that was really good and it kind of helped me 
go to wherever it was that I was going. Um, I know that I was never, ever going to be a Premier League player or anything like that. At the time, obviously, you think, fuck, I'm going to be the next best thing. Um, but yeah, I, th- I, th- I can't praise Kevin enough for when I was there at Mags. When I moved into coaching in a high school level, did I want to be the same type of coach as Kevin? No. I didn't think that was right when I got older, but when I was there at the time, I thought it was amazing. I thought he was brilliant, the attitude that he had, and he would always fight for his players, and he was always very loyal, like Joe was saying as well, about a lot of the characteristics that you see that's in a good player. You see that in a good coach as well. So I really liked playing under Kevin. Um, He did bollock me a lot and go mental a few times, and... Um, but I think that's part and parcel of the game, and I loved it there. Do you remember him calling you Houdini for disappearing up your own ass in big games? Because that's what I did. Look at the Shadow <laughs> <Cup Finals. laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he was like, he was brilliant. Like he just, he, he basically, he knew when to tear you down. He knew when to build you up. And I thought that was what was awesome about him. And I mean, I think that he might have called uh, Devinder Singh built like Tarzan, but plays like Jane. <laughs> And stuff like that, just these one-liners that you look back on it, it's classic and it's funny, but as a kid it really affects you. And I, I think that the way that he that he uses those little one-liners and he has a go at kids, it kind of makes them tougher and and uh, it doesn't just teach you about football, but I guess in life and the future as well, how to have a bit of a tough skin. Did you? So did you coach against him when you were at Mount Roscoe? No, no, I didn't. I'm just talking about when I was at Mount Roscoe and I was coaching for that short period of time, I didn't have the same philosophy right. as he did. Um, I had a slightly more relaxed <laughs> philosophy to Chill, coaching. More a chilled out entertainer. Yeah, you can call it what you want. It was it was kind of a, a golden era almost that Mags seen over those years. Um, you know, who, who were the players that were in those two years with you? Um, well, the first, I mean, two kind of different teams or two different kind of different eras. One was kind of leaving and one was going, coming in because I think the under 17s were just leaving as my first year. So you had like, Daniel Trent, Sebastian Perez, uh, the governor, Russell Hodgson, he was he was in goal for us those <laughs> days. Uh, Carl Smith, Wiley was obviously playing, who at that time was just very, very gifted and um, an unreal footballer, Michael Williams. So yeah, we had those guys at the start, and then at the end it was Lance Eason, uh, wow. Prince Kwonsar, Naveen Prasad, D Singh at the back. Um, Jason Rowley, Honey Fowler, Roman Priori in goal. Yeah, it was like it was it was a good side. Um, Can we just hover over Prince Kwanza as a high school footballer? Because I remember seeing him at national tournament, first glimpse of Prince Kwanza, and he was a man playing in a boys league, and it looked like he was the complete player. What an athlete! What an athlete! Where did he play for Matt? Center of the park. Yeah. So my my first year, he was. Third form. Um, my first year, he was third form, and he we'd go and watch him in the mornings before us play, and he just tore up the under thirteen, under fourteen, whatever it was he was playing in. He'd score three a game regularly, and then the next year we lost a lot of the a lot of the boys. They all graduated, so Prince came in as a fourth former and played centre of the park with Naveen Prasad. We played four four two, and he just absolutely bossed it. Yeah. Um, Where were you playing in this four four two system? Up front. Okay. Me and Lance Eason, yeah. That's another that's another name by the way, is Lance Eason. He was brilliant at school. He was stacked as well. He was, he was a man child. Mm. Played yeah. a game for the Kings, didn't he? I yeah, didn't he, he have got, a really bad one. leg break and that was kind of it? Yeah. I I think he must have broke his leg after I left yeah. the country, but yeah, man, that boy. Mm. He did play for the Kings. So what was your standing among obviously a lot of good footballers there? Were you kind of the main man in that group or were you trying to find your feet or <laughs> No, I definitely wasn't the main man. I think there, there was a lot of good players in that team, um, especially defensively, like Honey Fowler, Jason Rowley, Craig Wiley. That's three of your back three. That's a pretty good three. Um, and then obviously Prince was awesome. Lance pretty much ran the show up front, um, and I just fed off those guys. So, yeah, like the, the team was very, very good, but then we had good opposition as well, like Orton Graham were good and Westlake boys were good and, you yeah. It was good fun back in those days. So you, you came back for second year seventh to go on the New Zealand Secondary Schools Tour of Europe, which is where we met 
And yeah. there was a few of you that did that. It was such a big tour, wasn't it? It, it sort of been built up for a couple of years. That yeah, that was it the tour to the UK? Yeah, UK. Yeah, it was Spain, Ireland, England, um, Europe. Let's just say Europe. Yeah. Everyone who was in high school wanted to be a part of it. It was it yeah. was the big one, and it was four weeks. And yeah, we met at a few training camps. We both made the team together, and it was a, a great team. Um, on that tour, I actually, surprise, surprise, pulled my hamstring um, straight off the plane. What, getting so off the plane? Or? I think we arrived in I- as well. Ireland and did like a gentle sort of, fit, I don't know what it was, like a loosening of the legs. Yeah, and, you and Jared Smith, I think. And um, yeah, pulled my hamstring on day one. So I was out for three weeks of a four week tour off the bat. <laughs> Strong. Um, it's a bold strategy. But what I remember from that, well, there's a few things I remember from that tour. One of them was you were sort of went in as a striker and sort of came out as a left back, um, which was a bit of a theme through your career, really. Um, yep. What do you what do you remember from that tour? Yeah, like I, I remember I'd, we played a three five two. And I remember I pretty much played left wing back every game. Yeah. Um, remember... Uh, Who coaches this side? Jacques Verkouten and Gary Moore. Yeah. And I remember Gary came up to me and he said, you need to play left back. Because if you play left back, you'll make it. Or whatever like that. And I was like, fuck off, I'm not playing left back. I want to play striker anyway. Probably should have played left back. <laughs> <laughs> I think I bumped into that guy. This is completely derailing your story, but he was like, "Oh, do you?" I was talking to my brother about Wilkie or something. He goes, "Oh, do you know all those guys?" And he rattled off literally all of your like Stephen Ross, Michael Main, all these guys. Was he Rutherford High School? He is now, but he was Wake Westlake boys. Yeah, that's the guy then. Yeah, carry on. Yeah, it was just such a core of guys who stayed around the football scene, and you know Stephen Old and Matt Kaneen and Peter Howe. So we just, but we just played shit football. And I said that to you today when we were talking about it and kind of reminiscing, but I still was just crap football and wasn't, I didn't enjoy playing in the games, but maybe that's because I was playing at left back and just fuck, just bolting up, doing doggies all day, hmm. um, keeping up with the right winger. Yeah. But I didn't enjoy it. I know you seem to have a different perspective on it. And well, you didn't play. Well, I didn't really play. <laughs> I think I enjoyed the off-field camaraderie. I, I built friendships in that team, which yeah, I off-field, still brilliant. Are very strong today. Yeah. Um, there were some incredible stories. I don't know how much detail we can go into. One senior member of the the team <laughs> was suspended for a few games for um, urinating in, down the main street of, of Wales, I think, and uh, said some inappropriate things to uh, a waitress. And <laughs> you know, But it's stories like that that bond the team together and they, they share in those anecdotes. For, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you look at a lot of those guys that were on that tour, and I mean, I, sp- I still speak to a lot of them today. You mentioned Stephen Old then. Was um, seventeen? Was he an all white already? No, he wasn't. He was not seven. The, me and Steve. Me and Steve. Oh, because you guys. Were, are... Well, I was older than them. Yeah. But Stephen Old must have been what fourth form, fifth form. Yeah, he was young. All right, he was. Yeah, he wasn't. Wasn't an all white. So he's not what the year after. Quite yet. Yeah, 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 pretty close to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So, so you, we come back from the tour, and then I, I think you had a um, American scholarship lined yep. up. So, so was that Kevin Fallon doing? Yeah, How Fallon did, did everything, basically. He lined up the coach and um, in the States. And back then, I don't even think you could send video. Well, you, so you you, just, Stevie talked, you talked about that, didn't it? The, the amount of effort it took to put oh, together... Oh, yeah, Bruiser was doing all the video. Yeah, yeah highlights. It was old VHS. CD-ROMs. Yeah, it was a dad filming at an Napier tournament and getting it into yeah. some VHS. Yeah. And then I didn't even digital. go through that. So I think that, obviously, Kevin's got a good reputation... And he had a relationship with my coach at the time over there. And they sent two of us over at the same time. D Singh obviously went to university with me. Friend of the show. Good friend of the show. Um, Hawks Bay now. Um, but yeah, we went out. Kev lined everything up for me and we went over together. They didn't see us play or anything like that. Well, they, did they? Had they seen <coughs> Jez Field play? Because he went there as well, didn't he? Jez Field. <laughs> <laughs> that was later. We'll build into the Jez Field years. But I just want to... So, so uh, for me... <laughs> When I touched down in, you guys, you guys laughing about Chesfield. <laughs> no, I just before you before you go carry on with America. I just wanted to ask on my notes: Did you ever play New Zealand under seventeens, or no. did you miss that? I never played under seventeens. I played twenties. Yeah, uh, we got knocked out by Fiji. We'll get um, to that. We'll, yeah. get, we'll get to that. But I just wanted because my, my career is filled with success, <laughs> as you can see. But were you? Because you were a year younger than me. So were you? 
17s for no. the 99 World yes. Cup. I was, I would have been. You would have been too below. young. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so I was missed. like, I was like Dylan Hall's yep. age. Yeah. And he obviously was up there with the 17s. Um, Sanjay Singh, that sort of. Sanjay Singh from Taranaki as well. Yeah. So la- last two years in American college, you were a big success. Arguably one of New Zealand's most successful American college students. Um, but the first two years, how did you find it? Leaving family and friends, you had D with you, but how was that transition? Um, you, you know, you were one of the early adopted, uh, you, you were after the Ryan Nelson, Simon Elliott wave, yeah. but you were kind of that next tier of guys <clears throat> who were doing it for the first time. How was that experience? I loved it. Like everything about it, I thought it was awesome. Um, I loved flatting with my mates and I loved drinking piss with them and going out to parties and having a good time and then playing football every day and the education was a bit part for me I didn't really care too much about it at the time I just enjoyed being with people that I liked and having fun um so yeah my first two years was probably the I behaved the exact same as what I did in my second two years um but it was just I guess in our second two years I had better people around me to make me kind of look better than what I was in the first two years Mm. So, and were you a starting player? Yeah, because the Akron were, were a very strong team. Yeah, we were good at that period. Yeah, did you get walk straight into the starting yeah, lineup as a freshman? Yeah. yeah, yeah, probably just like yourself, really. Yeah, um, when you pay for someone to come over, you probably have to pretty much start them. Well, not decent years, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but but you know what I mean. Like you need to give them an opportunity to start, and uh, I think that maybe I I grasp my opportunity. Um, or they might have not had good strikers at the time to play up there and we, I think at the time when D came over there was two senior centre backs that were lodged in there that he couldn't really push out um, and the same with Jez we started with a French guy and an American guy in the middle of the park who were like unreal, uh, really good quality so obviously he didn't get the chance to get in there as well Did you know much about Akron before you left New Zealand as a uh, school? No, well where is that from? Sorry, I don't know. Ohio. Right. I did like the internet. The internet was kind of. I was just getting a grasp of the internet. At I, think that we, stage. I think we all were in 2000. Um, AOL. Two. Yeah. MSN. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I jumped online and had a look at it once, um, and that was about it. Um, but the fact that I was getting to go somewhere and they were kind of paying me to go there, you can't say no to that. Like it's a doesn't it didn't really matter to me where I was going. Hmm. What do you think? Did it matter to you where you were going with Mama? No. And it was kind of getting a foot in the door, yeah. wasn't it? It was getting over there and then realising if you'd made a, a good decision or a bad decision. Um, my first year at Monmouth was not very good. I realised I was kind of one of the better players on the team straight away as a freshman. Yeah. Um, but by the end, similar to you, last year was a really strong year. We had a new coach and, yeah. and a new setup. Um, but it's interesting. It seems, I mean, a lot more kids are going over to the States now. Uh, it's kind of weird thinking that you're, you know, one of the earlier adopters and sort of looking. Well, looking but I, I also think like the people who went over there when we went over, they're not getting given, or they weren't given a chance, as good of a chance as what the people are getting now that are over there. Like for example, Cameron Knowles, he was at the same college as I, that I was at, and he was brilliant. He got in all of the teams that you were supposed to get in at the end of the year that were in the college system. And then he got drafted by Salt Lake City, he played for them in the MLS, and played for another few teams. He didn't get given a game for the All Whites. Mm. Whereas now, it seems like if you do well over there, you've got a, a quick fire way into the All Whites camp. Like, who's the guy who just got the first team All American for Virginia? Joe Bell. Joe Bell. I, I'm, I'm not up with the All Whites and who starts and whatnot, but I'm sure he's been given a go. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Whereas, obviously, Nolsey hasn't even been given a sniff in when he was. Yeah. He was there, so I think it's good the way it's changed like that, but it's also shit that people like mm. Nolsey or whoever did well over there wasn't given a chance before. But more off the radar too back in those days. Yeah, you, big time. You know, like I remember the only way my parents could follow me, there'd be like a box score at the end of a game which would detail how many assists or goals you had and that was the only way. There was no video, there was no range oh, reports. There, there, was some, there was some like monthly newsletter that was sent out by New Zealand Football or something like that I think you could go on. Yeah. And it might say something about who did what in yeah. games. But yeah, there was no 
real coverage of the sport or anything like that back here out of sight out of mind yeah um so i was a year behind you so i think you were you were a sophomore when i was a freshman mm. um part of what we enjoy about the podcast is it allows us to ask questions and explore themes that we wouldn't normally talk about so i think it was your sophomore year that your mother passed away yeah um how how did that affect i, I sort of loosely reached out to you we weren't as close as we are now yeah um but I mean, that's got to rock your world. You're at a very impressionable age. Um, did yeah. you think about coming back to New Zealand, or how hard was it to decide? Well, I did. To... I did come back, obviously, for like the funeral and things like that. Um, but yeah, like we were in Valencia at the time, training with Valencia, which is unreal. Is when John Carew was there, so we we're training there, and I was I was playing well. Like I felt like I was going to do really well that season. Um, and then obviously I had the call to come back here. Came back and. It kind of wrote off me for the next six months. Um, started boozing a bit more, but then that's kind of been a theme for me uh, right throughout my career. Um, but yeah, like it was hard, and it was it was a difficult thing to go through. But I just think it's probably part of life that people have to deal with death. And as long as it, I mean, your parents are, should hopefully die before you anyway. Um, I think it's just something that people have to deal with, and right th- back then it was hard. Um, it obviously still hurts now, but it's just something you need to you need to deal with. So, well, did you have a support network over there? You'd only been there a year. Did you have a, some close friends? Yeah, I, I did. I had uh, so Alex Oddwell, friend of the show, only for this pod. <laughs> um, he he was very he was very good for me, and so was Cameron. Um, and also one of my other mates, Sanisha, who was really good. The the families over there, I mean, you know, all the families that you that were based in the states, they kind of made you part of their family as well. So they really looked after you. The coach that I had at the time, Ken Ken Lola, he was he was fantastic as well. He gave me all the time I wanted to kind of take a step back and 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 do my own thing for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I I had a really good support network over there. Um, I think it was probably a lot tougher for my sister and my brother because they were they were younger. Gave you something to focus on. Yeah, of course, definitely, overseas. definitely. Okay, so so that builds you into your last two years when you really started to hit your straps, and I think you built up quite a, a relationship with Sinisa Uduperipovic, who yeah. went on to play seventy odd games for the New York Red Bulls and was a real rock star sort of attacking centre mid. Yeah. Um, and your profile grew. You were like I said in that last season, first team All American. So. For those not aware of what a big deal that is, I think there's something like 360 NCAA Division One teams, obviously with squads of sort of 23, 24 people. Um, so to make that team of 11, the 11 best players in the country, it's it's a really, really big deal. Um, and you're almost a lock to sort of get picked up in the MLS draft. Yeah, I that point, one up. Especially as a striker. <laughs> um, so just talk about that sort of senior year um, at Akron, because Akron was a big school. Um, your profile was growing. Um, was there murmurs of MLS scouts interested in you? Were you thinking at that point you were on track for an MLS career? Yeah, I thought I was a sure. <laughs> I thought that I was definitely going to be involved. Um, yeah, like the, the season started really well and I basically played up front and the guy that played beneath me was Sunisha and I know he hasn't went on to do um, like he hasn't went and played for America or anything like that, but the kid was unreal. The ball would basically get hit up to me. I would just control it, lay it off to him, and just spin and run into the box. He'd beat four or five. He'd square it to me, and <laughs> that's all it was. It, none of my goals were outside the six yard box. He was just amazing. So yeah, he he was just he was so good. In so many ways, like we, we live together, so we talk about the game, and then we practice together. We'd always like go to the games together, leave together. We were kind of, especially in my last year, we were really inseparable, um, and that's what kind of helped me get into that, get into that team and stuff like that. Was he in that team as well? No, that's the thing that's ridiculous. <laughs> so he made second team All American, and he should have been first team. He was the best player in the country for me, um, but he didn't get in it. Um, so yeah, but then after that, obviously I went to the MLS combine and yeah, I didn't make some, I made some pretty poor decisions. Yeah. So let's, let's dig in here a little bit because 
you, you did, like I said, it did have a high profile. And I think this timeline was the the NCAA season finished. You got knocked out of the national tournament, finished the semester, and then you come back to New Zealand for yeah. three or four weeks over summer and then go back for the combine. Mm. So when you look back, is that the period if you could have a do-over, like you would do that over again and you would train properly and keep focused or do you just feel like you weren't really oh like yeah i think that i definitely should have i probably shouldn't have came back to new zealand um i probably should have stayed over there and trained but i really like socializing i like my friends i like my family and i like enjoying having beers with people and yes that is what i've made a mistake doing is coming home and not staying in shape and stuff like that um but it is what it is right it probably took me on a different different avenue and i enjoyed the avenue that i took and here i am now how was that mls combine experience what is the combine is, is it like a nfl draft where you gotta is it like the, no, the, com- so the, com- the combine something yeah something before it so you basically you turn up physical testing and shit yeah they do everything like that yeah so you turn up and they do the f- physical testing and then you get put into four teams and you play against each other i decided to go out uh four days before it started to la to hang out with my cousin and we just went on the piss um so yeah we went so, out so how old are we here 20 22 20 yeah around there yeah. yeah so i just went out on the booze um didn't think anything of it turned up to combine didn't play well i should have just said i was injured because if i was injured i, I might have got drafted <laughs> um, it's not in your nature though judging by the chatham cup <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah but i should have said that i didn't i turned up didn't play well um and then i i actually went to the draft so um the oh god yeah, yeah. <laughs> i didn't know that <laughs> yeah so the school that, so there was two of us that made first team all american oh, in the team and the other guy he's a french guy he was very good sitting midfielder and he got player of the combine wow like the he was first team all american player of the combine and he he was he was awesome his name was Johan Mosier. Oh, yes, I remember. Yeah. Um, Can I just ask, did he make it a, as a, a proker in the MLS? You, you're killing the story. <laughs> let him build. Let Sorry, him build. Jake. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, he's done very... <laughs> he, he, he's been awesome. He did well for Akron, did well at the Combine. So they send us over... Uh, so they send me and Johan over to the draft. And so the, the, the school gave us... I don't know. I can't remember how much it was, but say they gave us two grand each spending money for four days, which was called the per diem for food and whatever it was. And they put us up in these two big suites at the hotel. So where's the combine? What city? Uh, no, the, the draft, the draft was in Philly. So we went to <laughs> Philly. So we're in downtown Philadelphia. Um, West Philadelphia? Uh, we're, we're the Rocky Steps are, I think. <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> I was excited about doing this in person. Sorry, sorry, Ross. Carry on, carry on. Fresh Prince. Yeah, you got, um, you got there in the end. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So me being me, I looked at the money we had, and I looked at the room that I had, and I thought I can downgrade that room, use those finances <laughs> to get my mates to come with me, stay in the room with me, and we can just there you go go yeah. out. Yeah. And that's what we did. Um, I obviously didn't get drafted, and <laughs> Johan also didn't get drafted, and wow. it was a it was a joke. He didn't get drafted. Um, so after I didn't get drafted, we went out on the piss, obviously, and I ran as we were coming back to the hotel. I ran into Jason Batty, the all white goalkeeper. All white goalkeeper. Is he goalkeeper coach now? Yeah. Okay, I can't tell the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's good. Oh, we'll I can tell you the story anyway. But we're, keep, we're keeping that in. Oh, yeah, fuck, yeah, we'll leave yeah. we'll leave it there. All right, we'll leave it. We'll leave it there. And so you, it was a good you, night. You tell us off the record. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Damn it. how does? So, I, you won't even remember me. Well, uh, yeah. from, from what I remember during the time, the MLS had very strict rules on international players Mm. so i can understand perhaps you you underperformed at the combine didn't get in your mate johan was perhaps unfairly french french 
So was that? Do you think that was a factor for why he didn't get selected? It, I think it was from what I understood. It was a mixture between his age. He was twenty four, so he was a bit older, mm. and yeah, the fact he was foreign. Yeah. So I know that LA Galaxy were interested in him, um, and I think the last. So I remember the last pick. Um, so it was a, they, they were projecting who was going where and everything, and the last pick they've got like commentators that you can hear when you're in the you're sitting down in the draft and you can hear these people saying oh, they should be picking this person next and stuff like that. And obviously I was never part of the conversation <laughs> at all. Um, but, but LA were last to pick. I think it was LA, whatever. Um, but they were like, Johan Mosier, he should be the one that goes here. You know, they should be taking him, taking him. And I remember Johan going, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> like take me. Um, and they obviously just took some other guy, um, which was bullshit. He should have got drafted. Did he go on to have any sort of professional career? Shay's question. Uh, no. no. He went and played in the French sixth tier or something like that, yeah. I believe. Mm. He goes back to Akron every now and then. Last um, draft question. At what point did you realise you weren't going to get picked? Oh, what, I, knew, what, I, I knew after the combine. Right, okay. So 100%. You, you turned up not so expecting to go. I, I had, before the combine, I had an agent come to me and be like, well, I had a few agents come to me and say, hey, we want to sign you, we want to sign you, we want to sign you. So I signed with an agency. And basically, the guy after the combine was just like, you've shat it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay, so so you don't get the MLS gig. Yeah. Are you thinking, I'll try to play in the, like, the USL1 or whatever, the, the tier below it, or was it just, oh, fuck it, I'm coming back to New Zealand? Uh, no, I, so I got, uh, during, in December, I had some guy c- come and watch me from the UK. In Dunfermline, so they offered me to go over there. So I was going to go over there, and but Dad lined me up a trial with Dundee United, so that's when I went. Right. Okay. Went over there. Yep. Spent about what eight months there. So I think four or five months. Yeah. Yeah. Tried to crack into the first team. Spent a lot of time with the reserves. Yep. And no, we try. So you just in in Scotland, it's not like England where they can afford these huge squads. The first team and the reserves were one. So you trained with the first team all the time, um, and it wasn't anything special in terms of standard or anything like that. You felt like you were at the level. Of yeah, the I mean, I th- I, yeah, at the time, yes, um, there was no one that was outstanding. Um, I think, yeah, the biggest player there at the time was Derek McGuinness, who was just finishing his career, um, and then the guy who went on the furthest was David Goodwillie. He went to Blackburn for like just over two mil. Um, but yeah, like there, there wasn't, a, a, there wasn't a gulf between me and any of the players, so I felt like I fitted in well enough. So we kind of glossed over a small point, but you were born in Scotland. Yep. And your dad, Alan, is an ex-pro, played for... Yeah, well we were just, yeah, so yeah, he played for Arbroath. Yeah. Um, in the, he played in the Scottish Premiership, or whatever it was called then, maybe Scottish Division 1. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he was, he was a good player back in his day, he played centre-back around that position were you um, aware of that growing up that he was an ex-pro or yeah but you kind of don't i don't know it's your dad so you kind of don't think oh dad was an ex-pro or anything like that you just he's your dad yeah um and he was my coach right through my youth um he was a very good coach when he was when he was doing it as well um yeah he he, he was he, i think i remember watching him he used to go and play in Taranaki when we first moved there and he did just take the piss like he was he was very good um, and he scored a lot of goals because he said, told them he played up front <laughs> um, but yeah dad, dad was dad was a good player we've had, we've had a few um, footballers on the show who've sort of run a similar path I'm thinking sort of Cole Tinkler Chris Bright where they get met with rejection at a lot of points and they keep pushing on so obviously the the MLS stuff didn't work out you went to Scotland it didn't quite work out did you still have the fortitude to think I'm still going to make it I I know you came back into New Zealand went to Auckland City but after the Dundee didn't work out were you still thinking I'm I'm going to make it as a professional footballer? Yeah, well, uh, we got a call from Dundee United wanting me back for pre-season. But I just hated it there. I didn't like the guys. I didn't like the people. I didn't like the city. I just didn't like anything about it. Um, and I chatted to my dad about it. And dad obviously wanted me to go there to play because it was his hometown. 
Um, but I just didn't enjoy it and I just thought that I could make it somewhere else. Um, I think that at the time I was speaking to Paul Nevin, Pete Nevin. Paul Nevin. Yeah. <laughs> and I was speaking to him about coming over and playing with them, but then their squad was too too full by the time I contacted them. Them being the New Zealand Knights? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then, obviously, Rod, I spoke to Roger Wilkinson and came over with Auckland City because they were going to the Club World Cup. And to your point, yeah, I thought I could still make it and I thought I'll go to the Club World Cup. If someone sees me, I might get a contract from there. That was my thought process, mm, yeah. which obviously didn't event again. But before we leave Scotland, were the seeds of that trial sown in 2002 when the Red Badge All-Stars, <laughs> featuring both of you, played against Dunfermline here in Hamilton at the stadium? Well, fun. so funnily enough, so the striker at the time for the Red Bat, for not the Red Badge All-Stars. <laughs> that was you two, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we wish. <laughs> did, we you, on the bench. did you play, Steve? <laughs> I, don't. I, did, I did my hamstring in the warm-up. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having to go tell the coach that I I'd, I'd, I'd twinged my hammy. He's like, in the fucking warm-up. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky I got that fast. Sorry, sorry, yes, sir. Um, yeah, the striker at the time, his name's Craig Brewster. Um, and he was playing for Dunfermline. He never saw me play. I came on for like two minutes or whatever. Um, but Dad was his coach in high school. So when Craig was at high school, Dad was his gaffer. And then at the time I was heading over to Scotland... The gaffer at Dundee United was Craig Brewster. So Dad called him and said, hey, can he get the trial? So that's how it was lined up. And did you get close to the first team in, at Dundee? I wasn't. A, so the, I, at that point in time, I'd already played for... Uh, there, was a, there was some signing window that you had to sign within. Right. Or you could only play a certain amount of games. I can't remember what the story was. Um, but I could only play three games for the reserves... And then I wasn't allowed to play again. Um, but I did. they did sign me to the end of the season. And, yeah. So we, we had Wilkie, um, I don't know if you listened to the Sam Wilkinson podcast, I he did. told a, a great yarn about um, that whole situation with Rog and Kieran Jordan and the fallout. Um, He's so good at talking, like my stories are nowhere near as good as him. <laughs> no, nah, this, this is great, you'd be surprised. <laughs> but, but were you on the scene at that point? Do you remember that, that well? Yeah, yeah, I remember it very well. And um, what's your recollection? Of, of what, Rog getting sacked? Yeah, were you at that training when Wilkie, yeah, sort of 21-year-old Wilkie and Kieran Jordan were going at each other's Yeah, I was kind of hold. I was one of the ones that was kind of holding Wilkie back. Right. Yeah. And did you know that when that happened, there was going to be a division, and once you heard Rog was gone, <clears throat> did you think, shit, I might be gone here too? Um, yeah, I was pretty sure that that was going to be the case, and it was pretty evident from the first training that I was there at. But the thing that fucked me off a lot was I know that I did well for the first three or four games. I scored a couple of goals, was playing quite well, um, and then they basically turned around and said, you're surplus to requirements, we're not even going to take you in the squad to Japan or wherever the hell we were going. So at that point, I was obviously irate. Um, so, so you feel like, I mean, you feel like you were treated poorly. Do you think it, it was purely down to the fact that you were one of Roger's guys he brought in and nothing to do with the way you were playing? Um, I think it was probably, I think Alan Jones came in. And I think because it was such a short period of time between uh, taking over the team and going to Japan, they probably, he probably knew who he wanted in his squad and knew who he wanted to play in his style. So he probably couldn't be asked dealing with someone new who was going to come and do it. Um, or maybe he's seen a few games and he didn't like how I played or whatever, and maybe I didn't fit into his style. I don't know. But at the time, I was raging. Um, right now, I'm not that phased anymore. But <laughs> yeah, at the time, I was raging. Did you listen to Tinks's episode where he kind of talked about the 11v11 when yeah. he's overlooked by Craig Alexander yeah. to play? Did you guys talk as mates that... Tinks is going to Japan, I'm not going to Japan. Did that create any awkwardness between you guys? No, what, between me and Tinks? Yeah. No, so I didn't really know Tinks that well at that point. We, I was staying on his couch um, at, in, in Auckland. Um, but yeah, when they let me go, I basically, once again, a la what I said to Nolsey type of thing, <laughs> um, 
pretty much just stormed off and then I just went to our house which was Tinks's house grabbed my stuff and Tinks is like the nicest guy in the world so he was like oh I'm so sorry like I don't know what to say like shit situation <laughs> I mean like he is um, and I said no problem whatever um, and then I just pretty much drove to Fong Mata, um went and chilled there for a bit and found and then, my sorrows. then how long until you played for Waikato was it in the January pretty much the next week yeah oh okay which we played against Auckland City um <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so yeah, then went to Waikato, um, played against Auckland City, um, I think we might have drawn, I can't remember, um, but yeah, we played against Auckland City, just was still obviously upset about the situation, and I was speaking to a number of people about getting me out of New Zealand to go and play somewhere else, because I didn't want to play at Waikato, no offence to Waikato, but I just didn't want to play there at the time, um, and that's when... Tinks put me in touch with his agent who sorted us out with or sorted me out with Singapore and I persuaded Tinks to jump on the bandwagon. I was asking uh, Wilkie about what you were like over that period and he sort of said, you know, the memories are a bit blurry but I just remember Ross being just very bad. You know, he would have a mattress on the floor and he'd have a pair of jeans and a pair of shoes and that was kind of all he had. He just sort of floated around. I was basically homeless. Yeah. Fr- freeloader, I think, was the term that got used. Daniel. And reminded me, Daniel freeloader. It reminded me of a story <laughs> when we were, um, yeah, it was a beach soccer tournament yeah. at Mount Maunganui and I think it was me and you and Wilkie and uh, Byron Harris and Tinks might have been there and a few others yeah. and I think we won the tournament and sounds there was like that, that guy that, that group sounds like a lot of wasted talent wasted talent was the name Bloody of the team well um, yeah it was a great it was a great little day um, but there was a journo there who um, was doing a story for the Bay of Plenty Times and he came along and he had taken a photo and I think he'd got some quotes from you just talking shit as per um, and he comes along and he's like, oh, I just need to, um, I've got a photo here of the, the blonde haired boy. Um, can you guys just give me his name? I'm like, oh, you mean, you mean Danyan? <laughs> and he said, um, oh, Danyan, is, is that him? Is it like, yeah, Danyan. Oh, what's his last name? Oh, Freeloader. Fucking world, yeah. <laughs> sure enough, Bay of Plenty, front page of the Bay of Plenty Times. It was Danyan Freeloader wins a header at the beach soccer tournament. <laughs> I think we dined out on that for a few years. Yeah. It's still going. <laughs> yeah. I actually got called when I was sort of jobless for a little while. Wilkie actually started calling me a bit of a Danyan Freeloader, and I didn't know the story <laughs> before then, so I'm, I'm late to the party on that one. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take you to Singapore. So you and Tinks decided to go over there. We went into this in a bit of depth um, with him. But for those who didn't listen to the Cole Tinkler podcast, I went and visited Ross in Singapore. And <laughs> <laughs> and, and Ross is just, you know. just throwing up his beer. He finds that funny. Oh, that was quite nice. Um, oh, it was good. And wow. Yeah, what a what an eye opener. It wasn't the professional football setup I perhaps had envisioned when I heard that. <laughs> my mates had had made it in Singapore Um, they sort of played on the same field that they trained on Um, you know they were out drinking every night it was you know I think they got thousand dollars a week on top of all of their bills and accommodation and things like that Um, and they were above the level I think it was sort of northern premier league standard maybe with with a couple of a couple of decent teams Um, but at that point talk us where you are at that point in your career because we've kind of documented you've had a few setbacks are you settling at that point? Are you just doing it for the experience or, you know, is there still a drive to, to kick on? I was kind of caught between a rock and a hard place with that point in my career or life. I remember, because I was living with Tinks and Tinks is a little bit younger than me. Um, and Tinks was always like, oh, I'm not sure if this is the right place for us to be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was kind of like, well... I'm happy because I've kind of, in my eyes, I'd, I'm playing pro and I'm getting to wake up at 3 p.m. every day, play football manager, go to training, come back, play football manager and go to sleep again. Like it was, <laughs> it was my ideal life. I basically lived on the couch, which you guys know I love. <laughs> um, so I, I really enjoyed it. And obviously the gaffer at the time, he, re- he, he wasn't living with his wife. He was living in our, our, our complex so he was always a little bit lonely. So he'd always come knock on the door and say, hey, do you guys fancy a beer? And as you know, I'm not adverse, adverse to, to a beer. <laughs> um, so I'd always go down and, and Tinks wanted to kind of be a bit more professional about it and stuff like that, which I get. Um, but yeah, I, because Tinks was always there on my side at the start especially, 
Um, yeah, he was always saying, go to the gym and stuff like that and stay in shape. But I, I was just happy to be there in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, especially by the end, I'd done my osteopubis, I think I did. So I lost, I couldn't play anymore. Um, I think I was out for a good eight to nine months. So I couldn't play anymore for the last three months of the season. So I just enjoyed myself. Mm. Went out quite a lot. Um, was that injury frustrating? Were you quite angry at that point? Uh, yeah, because I wanted to keep playing. Playing is like something you enjoy. And uh, like I, even though over there I play, pretty much played left back again, <laughs> um, just up and down the whole time. But I just uh, I enjoyed playing and I enjoyed being part of the locker room. But yeah, by the end, when you get that injury and you get told you're out for that amount of time, it's a tough one to tough pill to swallow. Mm. Are you directing the anger about a story we've been... Um, well, I was just wondering, is that why you kicked the hole in the door to your bedroom because you were so angry or you couldn't get in? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, fuck <laughs> it out. I forgot about that one. Yeah, I mean, I think that we got paid in cash um, back in those days. So I think that I locked my door and I need... Maybe, I don't know, I needed to go get money for whatever reason and I couldn't get in. I couldn't... I didn't because we didn't get paid a lot. I didn't want to call someone to come out and kind of break me in and have to pay them. Mm. So I just yeah, just above the the handle on the door, I just just healed it until I could get my hand through and open it up. Probably for money, I assume. I can't That's remember. not exactly the version that we were told. I do tell <laughs> that you actually kicked a Ross McKenzie sized hole in the door. <laughs> <laughs> didn't use the handle walked through the door and then put posters over the top to cover I did, I did cover it up with posters yeah <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it was only one poster and it was A4 oh, well, look, somewhere along the line yeah. things have been Fruits in the middle. I wonder who told that yeah. Yeah. yeah well I mean the same person sort of might have indicated that you had been invited to a casting call for Panasonic TVs I got rejected why? looks <laughs> So they didn't like your face. They didn't like your face and you had to leave, but your no, teammate... it was more it was racist really. It was more of a race thing. I mean you're both European. Yeah. So what's that? No, they didn't like the blonde. Ah. It was the blonde thing they didn't want. So yeah. And they didn't even see Tink's face anyway, so <laughs> irrelevant. And Fucking and the other tink. one was we've talked a little bit about your sort of fiery temper at times and, and your anger. Um I've, as long as I've known you, you've always been very mouthy. But I've never really, I've never actually seen you in a fight. But I understand in Singapore, you got in a fight with a teammate, Australian guy, Angelucci. Yeah, I can't remember that. No, literally, I have no that. recollection of that. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's stay on the, I guess the attitude. I guess where do you think where does that come from? Um, I don't know. I mean, like. I don't know, I think that when I probably had, like, I did get quite mouthy probably when I stopped playing football and, no, you know what, it started in Singapore. In Singapore is exactly where it started, because in Singapore, without a word of a lie, you can turn around to the ref and say, fuck you, you cunt, you had a shit call and you can fuck off. And you don't even get booked. And so, I remember the first person that I saw do it was John Angelucci, the guy that I apparently had a fight with. And I thought, this is brilliant. I can take all my frustration out of the ref and they won't do anything. And you could. You could just go nuts at them. And then it probably just fed from there that I could just continue just to say whatever I wanted to whoever I want. Yeah. Um, is that what happened that night when I flicked Manny in the nuts? And you <laughs> and you said that he was faking. He was faking it, wasn't he? <laughs> he punched both of us. <laughs> Let's hope that doesn't happen again. No, nah, never will. I learnt my lesson. I've, I've retired that sack tap the from my... Tap. Yeah. Um, okay, so so you did one season in Singapore? Yeah. Was there an option to extend and you no. decided against it? No, no. That was just one no. and done. I had, well, I A, don't think they would have wanted me back and B, I had an, an injury which was... I would have been out for the next foreseeable future. Right. So, so yeah, I was... You're done. I was done. You're done. You bounced back to New Zealand, but you're still mid twenties, so you, you decided probably to, pushing late. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was timeline right. You decided to go and study in in Dunedin, Dunedin yep. for a couple of years. Did you finish your degree in the states? No. What did you study there? Physical education. Yeah. 
And then did you continue it in Dunedin? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I managed to become a PE teacher with seven years at university. <laughs> so it's fine. Good effort. So I think your claim to fame is you may have played for the most National League franchises, I think five, but one of those was Southern, who you signed for but didn't actually Correct. play didn't for. Didn't play right? for them. Yes. And they were Otago at that stage, by the way. Yeah. Otago. Otago United. United. Yeah. 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 Okay. That was in Philo, was in charge. Yeah. So Dunedin Tech, two years with them, made a Chatham Cup final. Terry Phelan. It yeah. took a while for me to realise who you're talking about. Yeah, good. Yeah. A little bit like me and the Fresh Prince. Yes. Um, and you had quite a good crew down there. Was it Sam Jasper and Campbell Parker? And yeah, once again, we had a great side. Like, what probably, we had the best striker that I've, that, that I've seen in a long time was Aaron Burgess. Aaron Burgess. The guy was just unreal. Like, he, he, he was just... I remember, so we had a tradition, me and Bergy had a tradition, which was every Friday, I'd go and see him. He owned Athlete's Foot in the big super, big shopping mall in Dunedin. I'd go see him at Athlete's Foot. He'd walk out and we'd smash Burger King the day before the game. If he took his top off, he had an awesome dad bod. Didn't bother like working out or anything like that. But man, his movement off the ball, his finishing in the air, left foot, right foot, just everything. The guy was... He was unreal. Mm. He was unreal. I remember we played semi-final Chatham Cup against Glenfield. Like he was ridiculous. He scored. He scored. We I think we went up one nil. He scored a screamer, um, like he like he normally does. They hit back two. They hit back two goals. So they're up two one. I think we might have been twenty minutes to go, and then Burgie got the ball. Beat a couple of players. Scored, and then last minute. Mark Fulcher was obviously in goal. Burgi gets played through. He's about 35 yards out on the angle. Just, like, chips Fulch, and it goes top bin. He runs over to his brother in the crowd who's drinking. He grabs a bottle of beer or a bottle of whatever he's drinking, some alcohol, and has a drink out of it. It was just absolutely mental. It was one of the best games I've played in. It was so good at the Cali ground in Dunedin. Am I right in, without naming names, thinking that there was an Auckland City coach that tried to talk to you after the game oh. and you gave him the, the classic McKenzie sign-off? That gave me a lot of pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't remember exactly what happened because it was, what, 12 years ago. Mm. But, yeah, are we talking names? No, we don't no, need to. We don't need to name okay. names. So, yeah, so basically... He Cole Tinkler in the Olympia mm. 11. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, was the, he was the assistant gaffer at Auckland City and he was the one who told me that I could... I could leave Auckland City. <laughs> and then I played quite well against Glenfield, obviously not as good as Burgi, but he came up to me, and I was taking a piss in the toilets, and he came up and said, oh, you played really well today, and I was like, thanks. And he said, hey, look, are you? would you be interested in coming up and playing with Whitehack? Because I know, I don't know who the coach was at that stage, but I know whoever the coach is at Whitehack. And I said to him, oh, are you involved? And he said to me, uh, yeah, I'm going to be the assistant gaffer. And I said, well, there's no fucking way I'm playing for anyone <laughs> like you, you prick. And just walked off. So that obviously ruined my chances of flight attack as well. Which is well, good. I didn't know. I didn't, yeah. It came full circle. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll get there. Talk to us about um, playing football and studying in the US versus playing football and studying in Dunedin. <laughs> uh, um, is it comparable? I mean... Well, it seems like no, in the states you're like a pro, right? Because you train every day. In Dunedin, you train twice a week. Um, yeah, you probably booze more in Dunedin, um, and you got different age players in your team and stuff like that. Um, but it's both were awesome experiences, um, and I can't say I really enjoyed one more than the other because they're both really unique. Uh, but I enjoyed both my time in Dunedin and the states. But the Dunedin. I probably went off the rails a little bit in Dunedin, which is why I didn't play in 2009. Um, yeah, I just enjoyed having a booze up with my mates and enjoyed flatting and stuff like that. And by that stage, I realised that I was never going to go and play professionally or anything like that. So I just thought, fuck it, we'll just go and have a good time all the time. Mm. So 2010, we've, we've touched on um, at Bay Olympic. And then I... Oh, Shame, sorry, but sorry. Pro, so prior to that, to add to your list of National League clubs, you had a stint with Team Wellington. Yeah, I did Team Wellington. Was that when Cole Tinkler was there as well? No, no, Tinks was there the year before. So how did you end up 
in team one? Did you just have a stint living uh, in Wellington? No, no, no. We played against Miramar in the quarterfinals of the Chatham Cup. It must have been that year. Um, and yeah, it was the end of it was the end of 08, 08, 09, yeah. So yeah, we played we played against Miramar, and I think Charlie Howe was the assistant gaffer of Team Wellington. Yeah, but he was the gaffer of Miramar. Saw me play and just gave me a call and said, "We'd love to have you at Team Wellington. Do you want to come up? <clears throat> Why not? Went up, played for them, maybe six games." Max, up until the new year, or yeah, I just played. I just played when I wasn't in Dunedin. Yeah, um, they could have flown me up, but, but. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you can so so by that you can tell how I played. Um, but I had a good time in Wellington. It was pretty fun. Um, what what generation of Team Wellington was there? What characters were in that group? Yeah, so uh, Brocky was there at the start, and then he went off and played at North Queensland or something like that. Yep. Uh, Sam Jenkins. Um, Andy Barron was there. Yep. Who's who was awesome. Like he was brilliant. Very, very good player. Um well, was Carl Whalen, Phil Emray. <coughs> yeah, those those types of guys were there. Brian Little. So a few of those that you played against in the in the Bay Olympic final. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I knew a lot of those boys. Even Campbell Parkin was there in the Bay Olympic final. Any good Campbell Parkin stories? <laughs> Yeah, Campbell Parkin. He is he is probably one of the best teammates you could ever have. He was just amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, one we uh, yeah I'll go into it. I've had a couple. <laughs> yeah, one we we had a we we had like a team session one night at a house or a pub. I can't really remember. And we called him Sheepdog. For his hair, I think it was. So me and Sheep were walking. We everyone got a taxi into town or something like that, and we were fucked off because we couldn't get in the taxi. And Fridge, our coach at the time, must have paid for it or something. And anyway, we were like, "Fuck it, let's go back to Culling Park, which is Dunedin Text Ground. Walk in, no one behind the bar, but it's unlocked." And Campbell's like, "Fucking hell, I need to take a shit." <laughs> so. So Campbell goes to go take a shit, comes back out, he's like, mate, toilets locked. So we go into the change rooms and the coaches are on the right. Campbell's like, I've got a good idea here. Oh, God. All I'm going to say is fridge wore size 12, Adidas, uh, <laughs> pokers. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. But nothing came of it either. No. no one said anything. No, no just might not be nervous. Scream out and carry <laughs> on. But it was awesome. Like he was just—he was an absolute legend, Campbell Farkin. It's the other day. So you graduate from University of Otago. Yep. And you get a job at Mount Roskill straight off the bat. No, I didn't. I, I actually, I, I moved up to what did I do? I moved to Fongata, uh for a couple of months. Um, and then I ended up once again moving up to Auckland, moving in with Stromy. Okay. So Stromy kind of saves me quite a lot. Um, and Stromy was like, yeah, come and move in with me and come play for Bay Olympic. So I did play for Bay Olympic and went with Stromy and then I was doing relief teaching at the time. Um, and I remember one day, I don't, I don't know if this is going to be aired or whatever but when when Sean Goldsbury called me he's with you and I just finished a day at Sacred Heart College and uh, he calls me and he's like Maka what are you up to I said I've just finished teaching what's up and here I'm in my like shitter $700 car with all my shit in the back of it and I said what's up he said how much how much money did you make today and I said I don't know 200 bucks and then just silence. And I was like, how much did you make? Oh, I just won the Aussie Million. You <laughs> come down to Tower now. Um, to, to give that some context, we were living in a professional poker house for three years. Sean Goldsbury was a, a roommate of mine. He won a Poker Stars tournament for, I think it was about 300000 New Zealand dollars. Um, yeah, it was massive. So yeah, we had a, a bit of a big week after oh, that. Oh, man, I couldn't believe it. I just drove straight down. Mm. Um, okay, so so you go to Auckland, um, and we, we touched on 2010. I wanna, we were teammates in 2011 and 2012 at Paralympic, yep. in probably two of the most enjoyable years of my football career. We had 
an incredible group of guys it there, was awesome. all sort of 25 to 30, all had given up the dream of, of playing pro, but were taking things serious enough. We played well together, we partied together. Yeah. You know, Danny Robinson, Pritchard, Ch- uh, Chad Coombe, Strong, Matt Kaneen, Jake Butler, Michael Main, Byron Collins, Colin Gardner, Colin Gardner, and Joey Edwards, Yoji Tanabe, Robbie Greenhouse. You know, it was a really good group of mates. Um, and and Stromy was kind of the, the ring leader of that. Robbie Graham. Oh, he was the year before I came. Oh, yeah. Um, but what, do you, when you look back on your career, we've touched on it a lot of it already. Where do those two years, like Nolsey as the coach, where do they stand for you in terms of enjoyment of your football? That's the best I've ever played. I love those years. Those were my peak. Not just uh, as a footballer, but socially. It was just awesome. But I loved it. I, I'd love to play that again. That was so good. How did the um, How did the Waitakere United National League signing or call-up come about? Was that just off the back of those two years with Bayo? No, you bet. I had, to, I had to beg. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was fucking hard to get into, like into that because you had a lot of players at that time that were just pretty much around the same standard like kind of run of the mill I I was probably in that group of run of the mill players that Auckland had they just had a bunch of players who were all right they weren't fantastic but they were all right and they could kind of pick and choose whoever they wanted so I kind of I got in the ear of Dan Robinson and Jakey Butler um, who were in the squad and I was like let's get me in get me in get me in and then I finally got, and then we, uh, they took me on trial to Raro. Oh, that tour. <laughs> what a trial. <laughs> I, it was just awesome. Yeah, like it wasn't, it was, yeah, I had a great time and uh, fitted in with the lads quite well. Um, so yeah, that's how it came about. And pretty much we did one session and then we had beers. And then the next day we had a session, then we had a game. And we had the session, and Embers was like, right, lads, take it easy. Game tomorrow against Cook Islands. Okay, sweet. Right, this is my chance. So I'm rooming with Jake Butler. Chris Bale comes in the room, and Andy Ralph. What's going on, lads? We're going out. So we went out, had an absolute session. Um, and I, after one or two, I was like, I, I can't, but I've got a rubber arm. <laughs> and they obviously led me on to a quite a big night. Um and then we played against Cook Islands, one, I think I did okay, but I think maybe the thing that got me in the squad was that I was mates with a few people. Um, were you signed as, you played attacking midfield or striker yeah. for Bay Olympic, were you signed in that position and then like we yeah, so, started with... Yeah, so I was signed in that position and then they went, that, I think, well, we had like a ridiculous forward line who you've went over, <laughs> like, to Reese, Krishna, Pierce. Yeah. Am I going to get ahead of them? No. And you got Baylow in the hole, or Butts. I'm not going to get in front of them either. So I was going to be a I was going to be a bit part player for them, which I was fine with. I just wanted to be a part of it. And then someone got injured. There was someone got injured at left back. I can't remember who it was. It might have even been Aaron Scott was injured for the first game because he was covering for someone at left back, and we had another right back in. And uh, there was a young kid who was going to start at left back, and they were training him there. And Butts said to me, "Hey, would you?" be interested in playing there and I was like fuck yeah I'll play anywhere as long as I get on the park so I just went up to Embers and I said mate I can play left back and he started me Um, and then from there on I think I just stayed left back for the rest of the season until the final Um, I saw in the photos you're on the bench (laughs) yeah but there's good reason for that there's good reason in the semi-final I basically just we were playing as Canterbury we lost 2-1 2-1 at home, or 1-0, I think we lost 1-0 at home, and we went there, I started left back, Timmy Myers was suspended, um, and first long ball came in, I basically played a through ball for Sleff and Dorfus, who scored <laughs> against us, um, and then I played another through ball <laughs> five minutes later for, I think it was Michael White, the guy who used to play for the Kings, yeah. so I played another through ball for him. And then De Vries and Krishna just took over and went nuts, and we won 5-2. So we went to the final. And I remember sitting in Christchurch Airport, and I said to him, I said, mate, you can't start me. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, and, like, it was just banter. He didn't say anything or anything like that. He was, you know what he's like, he's a real nice guy. And he was like, no, no, mate, you're fine, don't worry about it. And then I was teaching, I saw a phone call, Embers, and he was like, mate, look, i got bad news, you're not starting. And I was like, fair enough. 
<laughs> like, it's well deserved. There's no way I should be playing. Um, and I didn't, and Timmy came in for me at left back, and he was brilliant, and we won 4 0. And that was it? Yeah. Football career in New Zealand? Yeah, pretty much. Rode off in the sunset on an Emirates flight to Dubai? No, I think I played one game for Bay Olympic. Right. So who just before we go to Dubai, who over your career you obviously played with a wide range of characters. You know, you, had, you played with Krishna at Whitehack and Burgess, who you talked about in Sunisa. Who are the most memorable teammates when you think back on your career? Who stands out for you as the best players and the best lads? Um, yeah, I mean the best players for me, um, Sunisha in America. He was awesome. He was just he was unreal to play with. Very very good player. Um, and then I really like Aaron Burgess, as you can tell by me noshing him off earlier. <laughs> <laughs> he was brilliant. Um, Andy Barron, I thought that he was just both feet, box to box, could score, could pass, could finish. He was awesome as well. Um, those guys were awesome. Um, but then in terms of like just like characters and squad, for me it was the Bay Olympic days. Those were just awesome for me. How disappointed were you both to lose the semi-final in 2011 against Warrior? Oh, my God. <laughs> did you play in that, Steve? I did, yeah. I, I talk about that. That game was a representation of how strong that Bay Olympic side was because the amazing. bench was I'll, Chad Coombs, Michael Mayne, Byron Paulus. Yeah, guys was, in their prime, you know, late 20s. Got, like, everyone's in shape and fit. But we dominated. And we had a great like, team and we lost. Me. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was at the game. I watched. I sat on the far side of the velodrome in the freezing cold a shitter of a day that day mm. thinking these guys are going to fucking walk it and you didn't it looked like it was going to be a walk in the first 20 minutes because we were so dominant but we just couldn't bury couldn't bury our chances was it Suli Soromon is he the one that yep. dagger to the heart that killed you yeah he beat Strom for pace surprise shot strikers couldn't do the job aka me and Mecca yeah so. The oh, usual yeah. story, basically, yeah. for me. <laughs> Couldn't you just, what did Kevin Fallon call me? Houdini. 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 Yeah. Like I do in the finals. So before we go to Dubai, yeah. can we just talk seriously about Stephen marrying your sister? Do yeah. they have to be serious? Well, I, I feel like we gloss over it with a lot of banter a lot. Mm. <laughs> but how much concern as an older brother did you have that one of your mates was dating your sister? knowing your mate as you do. What, what does that mean? What are you insinuating? Well, that you guys Have. knew each other very, very well. <laughs> to what extent? Look, as well as you want to go into. <laughs> I'm predicting everyone's innocence here. But, uh. yeah, I mean, a lot of there was a lot of banter at the wedding. The wedding was one of the all-time greats. Yeah, and, it was you awesome. Know, yeah. You know, it's sad that Sam Wilkinson couldn't make it, but then you didn't make his wedding. And that's fine. It all Standing evens out. Standing up for family, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, but yeah, so was there any kind of part of you that was like... Oh yeah, at first I was a bit like, what the fuck's going on here? Like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, you've got the whole world and like my sister. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like obviously as long as you like that person that is your friend ends up marrying your sister, it's all good, isn't it? Mm. But when it's like, when it's not, it can end up like ruining a friendship and yeah. things like that. So... It's a it's a blessing, obviously, that Steve ended up marrying her. Oh, well, that's that's my rule, isn't it? If you hook up with you your did sister, always say that yeah. you have to marry her. Yep. and and I stand by that. Yeah, and Wilkie subscribed to that theory as well. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and good on him. Yeah, yeah. good okay. on him. Respect. And it yeah. brings, I mean, it brings us together on days like this. We've yeah. had a few beers in the sun this exactly. afternoon. Well, yeah, it's so. it is your sister Bonnie's birthday, your wife's birthday today. So happy birthday, Bon! Yeah, I know you're a big fan of the show. Thirty two yeah. years young. Oh, I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> I would not have said that. Yeah, but you can't timestamp this, can you? Well, we have now for the year. Shit. People know that it's May the 20th, 2020. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right, let's take you to Dubai. Because, like, like Shay said, um, your football career... I mean, you probably pulled the pin on your football. You, you would have had a few more good years if you wanted to, but you decided to move to Dubai. Yep. Um, your, your partner at the time got a job there at Emirates. At the uh, time. <laughs> well, she was your partner at the time. Still. She was a partner. Now you're married. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your wife yeah, Paloma. Thank you. Thank your wife thank Paloma. You. Thank you. Yeah. Bit of respect. Yeah. Um, so you, you've gone to Dubai and, and you've made the decision, I, I guess, to, to, you know, football's in the back burner, um, focusing on a career. Now, you went over as a teacher and you've sort of come back now seven years later as a real estate mogul. 
guru. guru. Property, property tycoon. <laughs> property tycoon. Um, so help fill us in on what happened over those seven years. Sorry, just before we, we do fill in on that, did you consciously or subconsciously follow the career arc of your father? It's vice versa as well. So I've went teacher after him, but then I've went real estate, and then he's followed me. So, ah, so footballer, teacher, real estate, and yeah. he was footballer, same teacher, but later real estate. Correct. But he followed Finally, you into real estate at last. <laughs> okay, yeah. so a little bit of both, conscious yeah. and subconscious. Correct. Right. Um. Yeah. Like the I didn't go there for career. Like you went there for the Durham's. I didn't even go for Durham. So I went, I went there because it's a new experience and Paloma was going there and she had a good opportunity with Emirates and she couldn't really find a job here because um, it was quite difficult for her to find a good job in Auckland. I was teaching at the time. Um, I was enjoying my football coaching with Mount Royal School, but I wasn't so much enjoying teaching um, per se. So I went there just to go for the experience and go with her and meet her out there and... Um, yeah, I didn't even, I, I taught about one hour a week, so that's all I was teaching, so I was more of a business development manager for the school, um, didn't enjoy it at all, uh, and was at the pub one day, and I met my first boss in real estate, and I was just chatting shit to her, because we had a mutual friend, and she was like, have you ever tried real estate, you should get into it, and as you know, I've always been interested in real estate, <laughs> <laughs> so... For those, for the reference there, Ross has a, a video on YouTube, which we'll link to in the show notes, which has had... 30, we always say that we'll link to stuff yeah, in the show notes, do. and we yeah, never we actually do. Time. Let's um, definitely do it this time. Which has had 30,000 views on a day in the life of a real estate agent in Dubai, and it's a bloody cracking watch. So, yeah, make sure you check that out. Was there any part of you that's gone to Dubai and thought, maybe I could make it as a pro footballer here? No. Not a, that thought never entered your mind once. No, no. no we're done. We're done with football. The football's done. We're done. I'm thinking, go over there, see what's up. There there, I remember there were genuine concerns. Well, not genuine concerns, but there were concerns. There were boozing concerns, <laughs> wasn't it? When, as the character you sort of described, Malvi Boozy Ross McKenzie goes to Dubai, one of the most conservative countries in the world with their strict laws. Yeah, Dubai's um, not a country. It's a, it's an emirate. Okay. Um, UA- UAE is the country. UAE, yeah. correct. Uh, Finally, At was there? W- did you ever get in, into any sort of trouble over there? Uh, no, no, never got arrested. Never had any issues with the police. For those of us that haven't travelled extensively, it's a, it's strictly speaking, it's a dry emirate, right? You can't drink alcohol. Is that correct or incorrect? Dubai. Yeah. No, incorrect. You can drink alcohol wherever you want. No, not wherever. Right, same as New Zealand. You okay. can't drink alcohol wherever you want in New Zealand. <laughs> so, is New Zealand a dry right. country? He's right. Yeah, okay. So, it's got yeah, a technicality. Yeah. No, but Dubai's brilliant. Like, uh, I mean, you I you, you, you threatened to come over a couple of times, Shay. Yeah. I can, and obviously, Steve, you had a couple of opportunities too, but never did. <laughs> but uh, it, it is brilliant. Like, the, the lifestyle you can have there is amazing. Um, the the places you can go to they're just all like five star awesome service good food it's it's a great mm-hmm. city to live in um but it's really really expensive so obviously when we first moved there it was very tough for us um to go out all the time with everyone and kind of keep up with joneses so yeah that's that's probably the downside to it as well I think the original plan was you were going to go over there for a couple of years. Yeah, a couple and of years. Come back and yeah. it ended up being seven. Yeah. Um, was it just, you were just enjoying it that much? Was it the job was going well? job was going really well. So yeah, I really had a good job. Um, yeah, did, did well did well with work and had a good bunch of friends and I'm, I still don't know what I'm going to do here. So moving back here was like, I'm coming back to do something from the very bottom. Um, so whatever I end up doing here, I will be doing it from the bottom. Whereas over there, I'd already climbed the ladder and I was in a, I was in a fairly good position. So I, so I just stuck it out there for as long as I could. And then actually, the the first run in that I have had with the police helped me come back. And was it the dogs? Yeah, the dogs. Yeah, yeah. What happened? So the I had some neighbours who called the cops. 
Um, it's and a dogless state, you know, that dogs there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like it, but yeah, the, the, the neighbours called the cops um, on the dogs for barking too much, and I was told if the dogs continued to behave like that, they'd be taken away from me pretty much. Mm. Um, Did so, you tell the police to fuck off? Uh, no, I refrain from that. Yeah. It's only on the football football pitch <laughs> I speak like that. Um, but yeah, I'd, I did some digging and no one said that they couldn't do that. So Paloma wasn't there at the time. So I basically called her and said, hey, look, this is us. We need to we need to go because I mean, my dogs, as you know, Steve, are like my family. So I wanted them to be safe and brought them over here with us. Mm. So that's, that was kind of the, the push, the final push I needed to come back. Yeah. So now you're back um, and you're living in Papamoa. You bought yep. a house in Papamoa. Yep. You've linked up with Cole Pivley and, and Regan Pivley to a yep. lesser extent. Yeah. Uh, and I understand, uh, I don't know if you're prepared to go public with this, but you, you might have put pen to paper for the upcoming season. You can yeah. get back out there. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm so excited to get back playing. What's it been? Seven years, like you say. Um, I believe you've actually paid your club fees as well. Yep. Club, club fees paid. Who, every, who every, with it? Can we announce who you've signed with? Uh, yeah, so I'd like to make the announcement today officially that I will be joining Papamo FC. Wow. Well, um, as a player, okay, not as a coach, <laughs> um, for the for the season if we have one going forward. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm buzzing for a day. Like, I can't wait to get amongst it. I've met the lads, um, and they're all really, really good guys. We've already got group chat and things going on and yeah we've had had some good times already and we've only had one training session so good yeah. times you've mentioned to me on numerous occasions that one of your ideal jobs would be to be a kit man is there any chance of you maybe coming over the Kaimais and kit manning for Melville United in the future in the future it's an opportunity that I would be interested in yeah um obviously depending on the bunts shape yes <laughs> Got some burner, nice friend, friend of the show. Um, Shay, how are we looking? Have we have we glossed over anything? That's been a nice tight sort of ninety minutes. No, it's been good. There's there's only as there usually is. I just want to. You're a very good contact for me as an aspiring football agent because you seem to have a number of quite high profile contacts all over the world. Michelle Salgado, did you knock about with the former Spanish international in Dubai? Yeah, we did some coaching together. Um, yeah, yeah, we did. Would you call him a friend? No. Okay. But Could you, you call him? You can tag him in the show and yep. see how he reacts. We, we often, we often so, do that. You've also... Um, I can give you his number. Yep, I'll take it after this. Um, Celta Vigo, you've got contacts yeah, in there. Yeah, so Pablo Coira, great guy. He, uh, he won the Under-20 World Cup with Spain. Um, he played with, I think it was... Puyol and stuff like that were in his were in the squad. Javi, yeah, um, yeah, that guy, top man. Um, now he's coaching in Device Sports City. Um, yeah, yeah, we can put you in touch with him. Just while we're talking under twenties, there's something that we probably need to talk about. You yeah. you were part of that under twenties team who lost to Fiji. Is that is that right, Shay? Bloody good Fiji team. Yeah, two thousand and two under twenty Oceania qualifiers playing in Fiji. New yeah. Zealand drawn in a group with Fiji, Samoa, New Caledonia, Samoa, Tonga, and we were lucky to beat Samoa. Yeah, I think two one. I saw. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we were lucky to beat them. McKenzie we- scores two against. Uh, New Caledonia, New, Cal- ooh, New Caledonia, yeah. and an eight 0 win. Yeah, that but... was that was very one sided. But yeah, the yeah, I uh, funnily enough, I got subbed against Fiji. Yeah, um, that's the last game of the group stage. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. The, and the group winner, the winner goes... was going to go play Aussie, home and away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we had Kenny Creswell as our coach, and um, we had some we had some good guys in our team, but we just. If you look at the squad, a lot of them didn't really go on to anything big, which is probably evidence of why we lost. Yeah. So. And was that the year? That was it with New Zealand youth teams. There was yeah. no Olympic looking. Well, Stu Jacobs did get hold of me to go to the Olympics with the twenty threes. He didn't realise I was twenty five. <laughs> <laughs> That was when I was in Singapore with Tiggs. That was good. Oh, that is really nice. Yeah. That is yeah. really nice. Um, <laughs> oh, you've, oh, I've lost my train of thought. I've lost my train of thought. I think that's us. Yeah, that'll be good. It's a good place to end. Yeah, well, that is a good place to end. Hey, Ross, 
thanks very much for uh, being so open and honest and I think it's been a really enjoyable episode for me I'm happy with it Shay yeah that was awesome it's nice to be face to face it's nice to finally have you on and it was really nice to learn some things about you that I didn't know before great it's been good to be here I've enjoyed it good luck at Papamoa FC hopefully we'll see Melvin the Chatham Cup next year yeah. when I'm playing again nice alright all the best Ross cheers guys <laughs>